Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to start on the next um, session on parameter estimation. And we're starting off uh, with Anders, and he's going to give us an introduction to random effects and how that might be uh, integrated into the next general stock assessment. So how do I point in the uh, yeah. oh, huh. Is there a point also? Uh, um, not the top one, but that one in the middle. Ah, excellent. Thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for hosting such an interesting meeting. I was asked to talk about random effects and that's a bit broad. I will try to focus on random effects and the use in stock assessment models. And um, I will not really be talking about SAM here, but uh, not directly about SAM, but SAM is one model that uses these random effects. Another one is the WAM model or uh, NCAM, some, uh, which is Noel Cadigan's assessment model. So as you all know, when we do assessment, we try to reconstruct some kind of time series from some observations that relate more or less directly to that time series and, and observations that have a lot of noise in them. And I like to think about it in these three categories. The first category is deterministic models where we sort of assume that the catches or whatever it is, is without noise. And if you have this simplified example that we have here, then you only have one, one possible way you can reconstruct or try to reconstruct the path. And that is just by connecting the dots, the observations, and you get a reconstruction that's like the black line here. You can see that it's too fluctuating because we don't make any, we don't try to filter out the observation noise. And you can also see we have no way of really saying what the uncertainty is because we start by saying that the observations have no uncertainty and all uncertainty comes from propagating the observation uncertainty onto whatever it is we're estimating. The second one here, the yellow is what I call full parameterized reconstruction. And there we have to specify through fixed effects model parameters, some kind of flexible structure that is flexible enough to capture the uh, process we are trying to estimate but at the same time has few enough parameters that we can actually estimate the thing. And that gets you to a balance act sometimes because you really want it to be flexible and you also don't want to use too many parameters. In this case, the model is that it's constant two by two. So in blocks of two, it's constant, but it could equally well have been a spline with some fixed set of nodes or some mean value plus some, some penalized Stevenses or something like that. The last approach is the state space approach where we try to set up a stochastic process to match what we think is going on and then we estimate it based on the observations we have available. So what are random effects and the way you can normally recognize them is that it's something that we don't observe but it has a distribution. So um, and some very often we use it if we need extra variation in our observations or if we need to have some correlation structure in the observation. Here comes the part that may sound a little bit strange at first, and that is that it's actually very often easier to describe the distribution of the unobserved random effect jointly with whatever it is we observe than it is to just describe the resulting distribution of whatever it is we observe. It may sound strange, but there will be examples later on. In order to estimate it, we need to do integration. I'll go into details in a second. And from these, from when we have the estimated model parameters, we will look at the conditional distribution of the random effects given our observations. And we can use that to describe, to estimate those kinds of things. As you know, when we uh, estimate from just normal observations, we have a model. In this case, it's a normal distribution. And then we try to tweak the parameters to match the data the best possible. That's how we estimate model parameters in normal setting. If we have unobserved random variables also, then it's a bit more complicated because imagine you have all the unobserved stuff on this axis here and you have everything you have observed on this axis there. And then your model parameter is sort of determining the shape of that banana there in the middle. So how do we 
how do we go about estimating our, estimating our model parameters if we have this whole thing here that we don't have observed? So when we vary our model parameters, we change the shape of the banana, but we don't observe this part. So what we have to do is figure out what the resulting effect in this direction is. So what we need is simply to integrate out in this direction so we get this marginal distribution down here. This is why we need to do the integration because we simply integrate out all the random effects and get it getting as a result the marginal likelihood of our observations given our model parameters there. So this integral can be thousands of dimensions in our situation and it's not super easy to do. So therefore we need uh, to approximate it somehow. And the way that it is an efficient way of, of uh, approximating it, it could be this one here. So we need this complicated integral here. Then if, we're, if we replace that, and this is where the approximation comes in, we replace it with a second order Taylor approximation of the log of this function here. And we choose the point where we do the Taylor approximation very cleverly because we do it around the optimum for all our random effects. So we need to optimize with all our random effects. So that's in itself is a big question. But once we've done that, because we have this, this, uh, this um, exp of, of, of that, then it, we can recognize the integral here as simply the normalizing constant of a normal distribution. So we have reduced this big integral stuff with just com computation, computing the Hessian matrix and uh, some determinant of that. So notice that here we de depend on the second derivative and that second derivative, the likelihood we need to minimize is this whole thing. So we need to derive that yet again. So we need up to third order derivatives. So in terms of the software that we need to support random effects, we need to be able to, to do this. So we need to be able to optimize, take derivatives of some parts up to the third order and we need to do it very, very efficiently and very accurately. So that's the demands on the, on the software that we will be using for it. In practice in TMB, it's almost, it's super easy to use because you just code up the likelihood of the things you have seen and the things that you have not seen, the random effects. And then you just tell R, tell it from R, okay, the random is what I call U here. And then it will make this integration for you. No, that's ADMB style, the separable function. And one of the things that makes TMB really fast is that you don't have to specify the sparseness structure yourself. It is, it, it, it is figured out from the com computational graph. So there are other options, but they are annoying each in their own way. MCMC is annoying because it takes a long time and you never really know if it's converts probably. Kalman filtering and, well, we can only use direct Kalman filter if it's Gaussian and linear, but we can make extensions of that. And the problem is from a practical point of view, you need to sort of tailor that Kalman filter or extended Kalman filter or unscented Kalman filter to the problem you have. So it becomes more difficult whenever you need to change the model because you also need to update that part. The SAM model was actually coded as an unscented Kalman filter first and it started out. So this was sort of the introduction to what is a random effect and what are the tools we need in order to handle them. Now I will try to focus on what they can do for assessment models. Where could they come in handy in assessment models? And the first one is almost trivial, but it turns out to be practically super uh, nice. So let's say you have a model of something multivariate. Let's just say it's multivariate normal distribution. You have seven observations there, but one of them is missing. Right here, it's a missing observation, right? But I like my code to be simple. So I would like just to be able to write this as my uh, likelihood function. So it's the same for all the observation. I don't li like to have special cases of now this is missing and now this other one is missing and all these kinds of things get, get, get the code bloated. So this is exactly sort of the definition of a random effect and unobserved thing that has a distribution, right? So if I just change my data set by putting in a random effect here, 
then TMB will take care of finding that marginal distribution and I can have my code completely unchanged. I don't even need to think about it. So it's simple to find the, the marginal distribution here, but if it was a more complicated scenario, then it might not be so simple to find the marginal distribution that you would need. So if you don't have random effects, you need to do a lot of work here. If you have random effects, you really don't need to do anything because this is actually code from Sam. You just count out how many observations are missing. Then you make a vector of missing values and tell it that that's, let's call it missing. And then you run through all your observations. And if there is an NA, you just put in the missing value. And once you've done this, you don't need to worry about missing observations at all forever in the rest of your program. So that's actually, I think, neat, even though it's a super simple, simple trick. You should remember that we are using the Laplace approximation, so it should be something that is suitably for that. Another use that is, could be useful in assessment models is if we need to, in, to, um, to introduce correlations into our model. So in this is a, for a macro stock, we needed to use tagging data. And this is how we predicted the number of, um, of uh, recaptures. That's not really important, but, but there was a concern that there might be an effect of the sort of tagging batch that if some of them went a little wrong, they would all be low or some of them, if it went really well, they would all be high. So they were concerned that the recaptures from the same tagging batch was correlated. It could happen. So that's not super simple to do in, an, in a negative binomial distribution where we to get that thing correlated. So what we did was add a random effect here because then this random effect is just for each batch or whatever. And then those that depended on the same batch would naturally be correlated and those that were from different batch would be correlated with those. And then you would set like something like that as a distribution. So you can use it to introduce correlations in places where it could otherwise be pretty difficult. And getting correlation structure right is the key to getting the correct weighting for your data sources. So that could be important. This is the main feature, right? Flexible processes over time. We are modeling a time series here. So in purely parametric models, this thing is, is pretty challenging because, because we have this trade-off between number of parameters and flexibility. And uh, it, so we need to think about where we spend our parameters. So there are many options available that are not really very satisfying, any of them. So we can use constant, that might be okay, but it might not also be, a, might also not be okay. Constant in blocks. So how many and where do you cut? And it's, it's, these arbitrary choices are annoying to make. Splines, how flexible do they need to be? Do we, we set the number of nodes and we sort of, those, those subjective choices are annoying to make. Mean plus deviance is what should the, the, what should the penalty standard deviation be uh, fixed at? And we have these, these things in, in random effects, you would, you would formulate the process that you mean, that you think is, is appropriate for, for, for the things you're modeling. So for instance, for a fishing mortality, we might choose to do uh, a random walk or an AR process or something like that. Set up a process where you say, the next F is similar to the previous S plus some process noise. And that's pretty flexible. It only needs very few parameters and if we set up the process that we like, then there's really no sort of artificial choices or discontinuities or cut points or things like that. And really when you do a, when you're trying to reconstruct a time series, it seems like a pretty natural framework to, to have these things. And I very much like Noel's way of putting it here. Anything with a Y subscript should really be a random effect. I think that's, that's putting it well. Thanks Noel. So anything with a Y subscript, there's a lot of those in assessment models. So yeah. So for instance, recruitment should be a random effect. Survival down the cohort seems natural to be a random effect. Fishing mortality, we also talked about. These are the, the logical unobserved quantities that we want to figure out. But really, we should also have the mean weights in the stock, the mean weights in the catch and things like that be 
be uh, the, the true mean weight in the stock be a process and then we have observations related to that maturities landing fractions all these kind of things that whenever we need to do predictions that's what we depend on also I disagree with Jim about whether it should be done outside or inside I think it belongs inside the model because it can these things can can affect each other if you have a big cohort size you may have lower stock weights or something like that so they I may have misunderstood you, Jim, but yeah. but I think it belongs in the model. So part of why we're doing this is because we want to predict. And if we smooth too much, think about the blue line there. So this scenario here, I'm thinking that we have some observations. Those are black dots, and then we want to predict the future with other circles here. So if we fit a model that's too smooth, then we will get a biased signal when we try to predict. Think about the blue line. If we, we uh, use one that's not smooth enough, so it's starting to fitting the observation noise, then you will just be sent off in a, in a random direction whenever you try to predict. So I would say one of the most important things we are fitting in stock assessment models is how does the next year relate to the previous year? So how smooth should this stuff be? It's really that what is important. So the correct amount to smooth should be estimated, not filled in from the outside. It should not be part of what model we select. It should be part of what we estimate in the model, the smoothness part. And if you do prediction from a state-based model, that's pretty straightforward because the model essentially looks like this. We have log n's in this year, log f's in this year, and then we have from the previous year, and that we have some function relating to this that contains stock recruitment, that contains survive, uh, stock equation, that contains a process for f, uh, things like that, and then we have some process noise. So going from one year to the next, after we've estimated our parameters, is just following the formula. That's how you predict. So you know all these things that go in, and you know how, they, how they, um, they relate to the next year. And the process noise you estimate here, that's related to how, how exact you can expect your, your prediction to be. So again, smoothness should not be left to the model choice or to uh, some input. It should be part of what we estimate because that's the central part of why we're doing this. So there are many advances to advantages of, of being able to predict. And you remember this trick about substituting the, the missing observations for random effects. So you can leave out five years in the middle and it doesn't really hurt that much because it's able to predict from each side of the equation. So here there's one where you, where you have all data in and one where you leave out some years in the middle and it seems to be able to get over that period pretty good. Similarly, you can predict uh, in the other, in the end of the time series. What? What do you leave out when you say you leave out data? I leave out all data for those years. Catches and survey, there's no observations in those. Is it five years or something? Yeah. Three years. So it's completely caught and the model is able to, to go past it. And this should really be the central feature when we compare models. It's how do they predict when you go forward, right? What, what is, uh, how are they able to do it? And we should do it with observations. They shouldn't be predicting things that come from the model. It should be actual observations. That's the only thing that's real. That's what we should be predicting when we compare models. Spatial extensions. So when you look at it, random processes in 2D, uh, spatial thing is really just a random process in 2D. And very often, I don't think we want these five boxes. We want something that we can, that has more detail to it. But, and we need a flexible structure. So similar to the, to the time processes. And very often we would need to predict to patches of space where you don't really have a lot of data. So, when you look at all this, you can basically repeat everything I just said for the time varying processes to space. That's sort of the principle of it. We should have a, a 2D random process that we can 
that we can use, where we can use the data where it's available and then use the process to kind of patch where you don't have data available. In practice, many of these things might still be too slow, but with TMB, there's a, a lot of very efficient procedures to do this, uh, structures in place for that. And some of them might be able in the near future to be actually used to put it, things like that into assessment models. Correlation, how much time do I have? You have 10 plus okay. three. Okay, good. So 30 minutes and three. Yeah, yeah. So correlation between stocks is another place where you can really use these random effects, I think, because stock or development of multiple stocks can be linked to each other in a lot of different ways and it's super complicated. One stock can eat another or they can compete for the same resources they can depend on the same environmental conditions. They can be targeted by the same fishing, fishing fleet, or maybe sometimes one is targeted and when they are not targeted, the other one is targeted or things like that. So to tease out all of this detail requires a huge complexity and lots and lots and lots of data. So maybe we can get part of the way with just connecting them in a more simple way, these stocks. So if we already have the stock development, the N matrix, the N time series as random processes, then it's actually fairly simple to model those as correlated processes. So you estimate correlation structure between the two, the two or many sets of stocks. And these, when you have these correlations, they can help you get more realistic short-term predictions. If you have poor data or missing something for a stock in a period of time, then the connection to the other stock might be help, help you to, to carry you over that. And we might get more realistic uncertainties. And the added complexity for doing this is very minimal. So the way we have done it, they use exactly the same data sets. So we simply, I'll show you this. This is Christopher from my group that has done this. And he basically set up another R package called multi-stock assessment. And you can, you can take fits from the website we have with, with the, the stock assessment.org. So here he takes central Baltic herring and he takes Western Baltic spring spawning herring. And these are, these are two neighboring stocks. And then he connects them. He sets up a vector of these two stock fits. And then there are some details about the correlation structure you can set up in different ways. We'll not go into detail with that. And then you can run a multi-SAM fit and then it runs the linked stock assessments. And if you set the correlation structure to zero, then it's just two copies of the same assessment. And then you can expand how much you want to correlate the, the dynamics in this. And you remember these increments in the process, you simply set up such that they are, are correlated. And that can get you some of the way towards having such stocks links linked. Simulation. You've talked very much about how that is important, and I agree. Uh, TMB has a fairly recent structure that you can actually simulate from within the place where you write the model. This example is a bit of a misrepresentative because it's a super short model. Normally you have a lot of lots and lots of code uh, predicting uh, your observation and all that. And then you have one line that says, my observation is a normal distribution, this and that. And then all you need to do to use this is to add one small simulate block the rule is that wherever you add something to your likelihood, you add a small simulation block down below. So really, for, even for a big model, it's, it would be like 10, 20 lines or something like that you need to add, and then you can do full simulation from the model. And it's always up to date with your model. That's the main feature, because if you have your external R script for simulating your model, it's always out of date with the changes that you have done in your model. Cool. It is super cool. So all you need to do is put in a simulation block wherever you add to the likelihood and then report the stuff at the end. Then you can from R afterwards say sim data, object simulate, complete data set equal true because if it's a covariate variate, you don't simulate it. So you just add it to the data set. So then you can simulate a new data set. And you can do this as, of course as many times as you want. It's super easy to do your simulation study, your, your, um, uh, all that. And it can be used for many things. The most cool thing it can be used for is to check the Laplace approximation. This is 
super nice. It's built into TMB and it, it can be done. So a result from likelihood theory is that the gradient of the negative log likelihood has expectation of zero. That means if you simulate a lot of data set from your model, then the average of, the, of these gradients of the negative log likelihood should be zero. But that only works if the likelihood is correct. There is no reason to think that it works for the Laplace approximation of the likelihood if the Laplace approximation is not a good approximation. So once you have a million of these or thousand, or, then you can simply test if, you're, if that has mean vector zero, all of these. And then you have a, a, test, for, for, a, a, a test for if the Laplace approximation is good or problematic in your, in your model. It can also be transferred into an estimate of the bias caused by the Laplace approximation. Because if you have even the slightest nonlinearity or even the slightest non-normality or something, then the Laplace approximation will not be exact, but it may be very good enough for our purpose. So it's actually more interesting to look at the bias and see if that's uh, at a level that you can accept it. So final remarks, I certainly think that random effects are useful for many parts of assessment model. And I think the modeling tool that you're considering uh, for the next mother of all models should provide efficient ways to, to estimate those random effects, especially for the next generation models, because as Dave said there, you should really be developing for the next generation of computers, not sort of the, the, certain one, the current one. Otherwise, you're behind. There are a lot of more details in these papers here. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks, Anders. Uh, questions, Jim? Yeah, just, just one clar clarification on the, on the mean. Using on ran the random effects part for weighted age, doing it outside of the model, that was yeah. only intended because I have the model in AD Model Builder right now, okay. and I wanted to use the right variance. Yeah. So I wasn't saying that you should no. do it outside. I'm saying it's a shortcut okay. and it's yeah. still important. Um, and just on the same topic for your things varying with why, um, is, do you have much uh, thought or feeling about the difference between year effects and actual cohort effects? And are they confounded? Like would, I guess just I'm thinking mainly on the weighted age. So you. you you don't expect, for example, that if there is a density dependent effect on mean weighted age, so yeah. five-year-olds with your observations are light, and so six-year-olds are probably gonna be light next year. So would so, that get picked up in this? So the thing with, with having stock weights in as random effects, that's under development, I haven't got it yet. So it was just a suggestion for next generation that it, we also put that in as processes. But there's nothing technically uh, difficult with doing cohort effects. I don't think so. I don't think so, but you would need to do simulation study to validate as you always should. Okay. Any other questions? I, I have a question. So in TMB, um, right, the main feature, one of the main features is the random effects, right? Yeah. So if you built a big, huge model and then you didn't, invoke the random effects is there any extra overhead or is it no no and it, and but on the other hand you also don't really get a speed improvement at least in our experience we it depends on if you have big heavy matrix computations then you will get a speed improvement also but in the normal thing if you throw a million for loops together and all that then ADMB TMB is similar in speed i did i'd have one Sorry, on, no. on the simulate, does that add any overhead when you're not doing it? No, no. All of these are macros, so that they don't really know about it when, you, when you're when not doing it. It's cool, that feature, yeah. 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 Oh. Hi. Yeah, so I'm, I'm perhaps showing my ignorance here, but um, for purposes of model selection, I'm just wondering how you deal with the degrees of freedom and how you, how you measure that. Um, so I have an appendix with random stuff someone may ask. <laughs> and um, so the degree of freedom for our purposes, I would say is the fixed effects model parameters. B 
because I always look at this example when I'm trying to get my head around that. This is, if you have a Poisson distribution and let's say you have a thousand observation and you put in a random effect for each to get over dispersion, then we know and can calculate exactly that that distribution will be that one, negative binomial. And, no, and you get the same likelihood and you get everything is the same. So no one would argue that that model has more than two parameters, even though it had a thousand random effects. So for our purpose, with the likelihood ratio test and all that, I would say we are counting the fixed effect parameters. Um, Hans. Yeah, uh, I wasn't going to follow up on that, but, uh, but I agree completely the way to count the parameters, let's say in AIC. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, penalized splines, and many people would like to use penalized splines. Let's say you want a flexible recruitment function, uh, and then you, then th that fits very well into this uh, flexible uh, random effects framework because then you let the coefficients of the spline be a random effects and you estimate the smoothing parameter of the spline as a, uh, as a variance parameter. Yeah. So then it, it's, in TMB it's very easy to do. You just read in the spline basis from the MGCV package. So it's one line of R code and a few lines of uh, TMB code. So then you can do everything you like with spline, thin yeah. plant spl splines, whatever you like. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not the normal way that it's done in this community. The normal way is to fix the, fix the, the smoothness from the model selection part. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, then I, don't I, estimate the variance. Uh, th those yeah. are different types of splines, but yeah. I mean, yeah. a lot of people would like. You to need the random effects to estimate it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rich, it was just a quick question on choices for your random effects when there's things you might want to use in projections. Yeah. You know, that you might want to use a random one within your model, but again, it's quite hard yeah. to defend in a projection sense. And yeah, just your feelings on that. Yes, I completely agree. It's something if you want to do long-term prediction, you don't want to do, you, if you want to do long-term prediction, you don't want to have a random walk. You want to have a stationary process of some kind. But it's what you want to do with it. Okay, any other questions? Bye. So for um, a question regarding the simulate module, um, how so easy the simulate uh, section, um, how easy is it to simulate composition or proportional data? Okay. Oh, maybe I'm not 100% sure. But if it's not there, it can easily be there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's not a very helpful answer, you know? No. Well, it is because you can ask me and I'll put it there. I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, right. Okay, thanks, Anders.